Welcome to another <laughs> McKee, or James A. McKee Association Community Conversation. Uh, in our informal chat, you've already received an introduction, but uh, David Graham is our Green County Auditor. Uh, and we welcome you, David. Thank you. Thank you. So, first thing I'm going to say is, with a small group like this, by all means interrupt me if you have a question. And hopefully we have a lot of time for discussion at the end because I was told, you know, kind of what to prepare for. Um, but ultimately, my job I look at is to inform you guys and answer your questions. Me guessing at what you want to know, or, or listening to somebody else say, "Hey, well, focus on these issues." Not saying the issues I have aren't uh, important, but again, you know, to, to it's really about you and informing you and getting you involved in it. So. Uh, we're going to talk about some terminology, how to calculate taxes, some of the tax credits, different types of levies, and then we're going to actually look at a little bit of where your taxes go and um, the types of levies that you have. So that will go ahead. Um, I always say property taxes are not uh, overly complicated, but they're not as simple as they want to be. So first we have to understand certain terminology. We have appraised value or market value. That's the value that the auditor determines. Okay, we update property values every three years, unless you have new construction or something like that where we pick it up more frequently. Um, but every six years we do a reappraisal. We just completed our reappraisal for tax year 2020, pay 2021. So I got yelled at a lot this year about how could my value have gone up this much? And I say, well, did you look at what properties they're selling for in your neighborhood? Yeah, but that's just this current market. It's not sustainable. And it's like, yeah, but I'm measuring the current market, unfortunately. So, I mean, I agree with most people. I don't think this market is sustainable. Eventually, interest rates will go up, and that will flatten the market a little bit. I'm not suggesting that we're going to have a recession like we had before. I think we learned a lot of lessons, um, at least from the banking industry side. I think they, they learned a few things that uh, they, they realized them owning property is not a benefit to anybody. Um, so in every three years in between, we do a triennial update. So a triennial update is just purely a statistical model where we look at what are sales in this neighborhood. If they're 10% higher than my value, then we add 10% to it. Where a reappraisal, we're actually at some point have inspected every property. Now we don't go inside properties. Most people would consider that an invasion of their privacy. Um, but we do an exterior inspection. We use a lot of technology to do this now versus back in the day we had boots on the ground walking around houses. Um, now we capture a lot of imagery, um, either aerial, uh, oblique. And, uh, this past time we actually had a van dro driving around taking pictures of, of properties. We probably won't do that again. I was getting yelled at way too much by people saying, you have no right to come onto my property. It's like, well, statute actually allows me to come into your house. So <laughs> let's back it up just a little bit. But obviously, I don't want to do that. I don't want to invade somebody's privacy. And in today's world, I don't want to subject the public to appraisers that uh, I hire a company to, to do. And I don't want my people subjected to what's going on in some of these houses. So. Um, the next uh, term is assessed or taxable value. This is equal to 35% of your appraised value. So um, this is the value that the tax rate actually applies to. We have full, the other thing I love, as you can see, we have two terms for everything that we're talking about. We can't just stick with one term. We have to have multiple. We have the full or voted rate. This is the rate uh, that was approved by the voters in most situations. Um, there is some inside millage that was established in statute, but for the most part, this is the rate that you vote on. The effective rate is the rate that you actually pay on. And we'll kind of go through an example of how an effective rate is created. Um, and it's the reduction factor that creates that effective tax rate. But like I said, we'll discuss that a little later. Um, the other thing is a mill. A mill is equal to a dollar of tax for every thousand dollars of assessed value. So that means that property that's appraised at hundred thousand dollars, a one mill levy will cost it thirty-five dollars per year. And, and you can see the math that, that makes that work. So calculating your taxes, this was one of the things that they said, 
walk through how the steps to calculate a tax bill so people can do it on their own. You have to have a lot of knowledge, you have to have a lot of information. Uh, all is available on my website, but um, you know, to start with, I use the $100,000 example. Obviously, if you're gonna calculate it on your property, you have to know what your property is appraised for. So you take that appraised value times the assessment ratio of 35%. The 35% actually came to be, uh, prior to county auditors being the uh, chief appraiser for the county, there was an appraisal office, and the state decided to do a study statewide. On average, what appraised value are these county appraisers putting on property? The statewide average was 35%. So they said, hey, we're gonna start making you guys appraise more accurately, but we're going to apply this assessment ratio of 35% so that everybody doesn't just get this huge tax increase from being under appraised for years and jumping up. Historically, do you remember what year that? I, I wanna say that was the uh, mid to late 30s. Now, I don't remember it. I've heard <laughs> this in a presentation that was given, of course. Uh, yes? But that's set by statute and subject to the whims of the legislature. Yes, so these, I, I, the stat, state law does establish the assessment ratio. And so it can change, so it hasn't changed. 25 tomorrow. Um, you know, they, they could, um, so public utility, honestly, when they did away with personal property tax, um, what they did, they, those, all those statutes still exist. They just set the assessment ratio. It used to be at 25%. They set the assessment ratio at zero. So all those laws, technically, we still have personal property tax in Ohio. We just have an assessment ratio of zero, so nobody ever has to pay it <coughs> or file forms. Just for clarity, personal property is not physical property. Correct, and, and personal property generally wouldn't be an individual's property, it would be business property. So, uh, inventory, equipment, yes? Securities? Securities used to be taxed long ago. Um, actually, grain used to be taxed long ago. Uh, and, and these are things that they so far predate me and I haven't heard anybody do a presentation on it. So, I'm not overly familiar with with how those tax rates were established or what the assessment ratios or anything were. Well, it's when you say personal property tax, there's two types of property, real property and personal property. So, well, that's, that summarizes the distinction I was trying to make. Let, let's let you finish. Oh, sure. by, by, I say by all means. Um, so the effective tax rate in taxing district F19 is 64.09 mills, that $35,000 times 64.09 divided by 1,000, because the mill is equal to a dollar of tax for $1,000 of assessed value, gives you a tax before credit of $2,243.19. Now there are three credits in the state of Ohio, the non-business credit, the owner occupancy credit, and then homestead. So the non-business credit, you receive that just by virtue of not owning a commercial or an industrial property. If I have it class categorized or classified as residential or agricultural, you automatically receive what used to be called the 10% rollback, but it's only a 10% rollback on levies, on qualifying levies, and a qualifying levy is defined as any levy that was put on the ballot or approved prior to August 2013. So, yes? What if your home is used as a business, um, but it's a computer business in your home? So generally, we're going to look at what is the primary use of this property, okay, in that primary purpose. So if I like to cook food, so occasionally I'll cater for uh, a graduation party. Am I technically using my kitchen as a business purpose? Yeah, but the predominant use is not. Okay. That the predominant use is for a residence, where if I were to, sh you know, kick my kids out, have my wife and I run a pizzeria out of our house, and we, we weren't sleeping there, then that would be a commercial property. Okay, so um, it's important here again going back to a qualifying levy. So if a levy is renewed after this date, it continues to qualify as a qualifying levy. 
if a levy is replaced or an additional levy is put on, then it does not qualify for the non-business credit. Okay. And the calculation here, in this case, 93% of the village's levies are qualifying levies. So where that used to be a 10% rollback, now it's a 93.357% rollback. So the math is pretty simple. You just take your net taxes times that 93%, and that calculates what your credit is. Or 9.3%, sorry. The owner occupancy credit, you actually do have to fill out a form to qualify for this. You have to claim that property as your primary residence. If you own a house in Florida and claim residency in Florida, you cannot get the owner occupancy credit in Ohio. Okay. And the other thing that's unique with the owner occupancy credit in addition to the application is only certain value qualifies. So again, if you're an agricultural property owner, you own 100 acres that you're farming, you've got a bunch of outbuildings, the only thing that's going to qualify is the one acre home site and the structure that you live in. Now there are situations where you don't have an attached garage, you have a detached garage, that detached garage qualifies, but you can only get one garage, so if you have an attached and a detached garage, then the detached garage can qualify. So, yes? This is something that you have to apply for, and if you don't know about it, it could be automatically put on when you built or bought the house decades ago, and you'd never know about it. Is there some way to go on to the county website to find out whether my house is getting this credit? Absolutely, yes. You could, we've got it um, under green online. We have a property search tool. You can bring up your property. You can look at the detail of your tax bill. And it, it will be on your tax bill also, and there's a line. I'm sure it's shorthand for owner occupancy credit, but um, that it, it would appear on your tax bill. Yes? One of my frustrations is I used to be able to get the carbon tax within plus or minus $5 or something. With the rollbacks, they were pretty standard. You could just, but now it's kind of black magic. It's okay. And me too. I, I mean, remember, it bothers you, and you're just trying to calculate yours. I'm sitting with the taxpayer across the desk from me and saying, in essence, trust me, I'm the government. I'm here to help. I'm here to help. <laughs> so, you know, I was the County Auditors Association, and I personally uh, did not like this legislation. This is the way that uh, this was never a bill. This was not introduced, never had a hearing, never had anything. It was thrown into the budget in conference committee. So it wasn't even debated as part of the budget. In conference committee, this provision was added. So, you know, you're not going to hear me say, because I, I agree with you. I mean, look, I'm spending 10 minutes talking about something that should just be, it's 10% or 2.5%. But it shows the vulnerability on any of those provisions, like the 35% or whatever. Yeah. I, I agree. We've made value times rate. I mean, honestly, think about property taxes. Value times rate equals tax. We're talking about a lot more than that. And, and I, I will tell you, my personal opinion is we get upset in government because the public just doesn't care. They want to complain all the time, but they don't care. But we've made things so complicated that sometimes they aren't grasping. And, and it's not that they're ignorant. Um, it's that we have overcomplicated things. And, and if we went back to a simple approach to governing, I, I think people would be a lot more involved. But I don't get to control that. Yes, ma'am. So how much, like a $100,000 assessed value on a home, how much would the owner occupancy credit rate? So actually, and that's kind of what we're doing here, only I, I did adjust it a little bit. So assessed value of $35,000 would represent a $100,000 home. Oh. Now in this case, I said there was an outbuilding, so I could show the calculation that not all value uh, it, it qualifies. So I subtract and that. There it is. And, and so it's $44.87. Okay, yep. I haven't read that so, that far. And, and like I said, you, know, you, you can go through the, the, the math there, but oh, thank you. certainly. 
So the homestead is the one that will get you the biggest bang for your buck if you qualify. So you have to qualify for the owner occupancy credit, which means that house is your primary residence. You must be 65 or older the year that you qualify, or be permanently disabled, and have a Ohio adjusted gross income of $34,200 or less. So um, that is something, I, 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 again, I like to take on state legislators. I probably shouldn't, but um, when I first came into the auditor's office, the Homestead program was means tested. It was based on your income, and there were three levels. Uh, if you, the, the income was between here and here, it was this percentage, and, and so on and so forth. So um, when Governor Strickland came in, he said, no, we are offering Homestead to anybody over the age of 65 are permanently disabled, okay. period. There's no means testing, there's no question about it. All you have to do is show proof of age. Once those people qualify, they continue into the program. They're, they will never have to prove income. When um, Governor Kasich came in, he eliminated the, well, he put the means testing back on. So what does this mean? That means people um, I, I, I can't think of any really rich people off the top of my head. We'll just use my mother. She's not really rich, but she qualified during the period of time that it was not means tested. She never has to prove income. Somebody who is, you know, maybe literally living Social Security check to Social Security check, but they're getting, their income is more than $34,200, doesn't qualify. Though my mother's income, and I don't know what it is, but we'll, we'll say it's $70,000 a year. You know, she's going to continue to qualify for that program. So this is where I always say, you know, the state always likes to point to local governments and say, you guys are inefficient. And I always like to point back and say, well, when you create three sets of rules to run one program, it's hard to be efficient. So, um, no. yes? The Social Security for Ohio purposes is not part of your adjusted gross, right? It is your, Ohio adjusted gross income is what, it, generally it is not, I'm not an income tax expert. Um, generally your Ohio adjusted gross income would exclude Social Security. Um, but if you look, if you ever wanna know if you qualify, look on our website, that $34,200 gets adjusted every year by an inflationary index. And if your income, Ohio adjusted gross income is less than that, then by all means file. And if you ever have any questions, contact my office. We'll, we'll be happy to walk you through. We really don't like people to apply that we know aren't going to qualify because I have to send you a certified letter denying it, and that costs the taxpayers about five, almost six dollars now. So, okay. So there is an additional provision. So the homestead, what it does is it takes first twenty-five thousand dollars of appraised value and makes it tax exempt to you. So whether you live in a million dollar house or a $50,000 house, the benefit is exactly the same, it's $25,000. If you are 100% military disabled or the spouse of a first responder killed in the line of duty, that 25,000 increases to 50,000. Okay, so to calculate the homestead credit, like I said, you've got a $25,000, the $25,000 of appraised value that's exempt to you. So you take that $25,000, apply the assessment ratio, get the assessed value of $8,750. You would apply the effective tax rate, same rate we've been using throughout, and see that your, your homestead credit before your other credits is $560, but we have to subtract off because you're not paying tax on this, so you don't get credit for the uh, non-business or owner occupancy. So the net savings in this case is $495.36. So roughly, if you live in the village of Yellow Springs and you qualify for a homestead, that's the annual tax savings that you receive. In, in addition to the owner occupancy credit and the non-business credits. So if you go through all those slides with all that math, Ultimately, you end up assuming that the individual qualifies for homestead with a tax bill of right around $1,500. For $100,000 of appraised value. And 
then if you don't qualify for homestead, it's roughly $2,000. Any questions on calculating your process or eligibility? Does, do you list the link in here? Yes, available tools. We could review all this by going to one of these links, right? Yeah, well, hopefully we have time at the end. Okay. Um, I couldn't get my computer to sync to my phone so that I could get on the internet. Um, I was wanting to show you some of the cool stuff we have out there, but I encourage people. Um, one thing I want to do probably more than, you know, obviously I don't want to have my name in the paper a whole lot, um, but I want to inform people. I want you guys to understand. I, I want you, you know, like I said, property taxes, of all the taxes, property taxes are the most unfair. Okay. So you've got income tax, it's based on how much you make. Sales tax, it's based on what you buy. If you don't want to pay those taxes, you are actually in control of how much tax you pay. Property taxes, you have no control over the value of your property. Um, the, there was a, a little old lady who lived on Fairfield Road. She had about eight acres right on Fairfield Road. She had a house. Raised her kids in that house. Her husband passed. She wanted to, went to the city to try to get a variance on the zoning issue so that she could put another house back behind where her house was. Plenty of land to do it, but it would have to sit back behind. It wasn't wide enough. Um, and of course, city denied it. Um, and she wanted to build the house so that her kids could live there and she could stay in her house longer. So if you look at this, you've got a subdivision here and a subdivision here. Both have roads that dead end right into her property. You know what's going to happen to that property. But what I, I told her, I said, well, I understand where you're coming from. I, I really do. But I have an appraised for, and I don't remember how much it was appraised for. But th this is what I have an appraised for, because I've been offered a lot more than that to sell it. So it doesn't mean my appraisal's wrong. It means property taxes aren't fair. She can't control the value of that property. She owns prime land right on Fairfield Road in Beaver Creek. And I'd say, you know, Yellow Springs has run into a very similar issue. You have a shortage of housing stock and a high demand for people to move here. I, I joke with my appraisers, or I half joke with my appraisers. I said, we ought to have just three neighborhoods in Yellow Springs, walking distance to downtown, biking distance to downtown, and no, you have to get in a car and drive to downtown. Those are the only three neighborhoods we need. Or you can still hear cows move. I'm sorry? That, that's that last circle is you can hear cows move. <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask because years ago, my mom told me that there were at least 10 or 12 distinct areas that the tax office uses but, but we don't necessarily know what those areas are. Is that still true? Or yeah, not? yeah, actually we, every place has neighborhoods that we establish. And I, I don't know Yellow Springs nearly as well as I know Xenia. I grew up in Xenia, lived there my entire life. If you live in Amlin Heights in Xenia, that is a more desirable place. I don't know why, there's still a lot of three-bedroom brick ranches, they're larger than what they are in the area I grew up. I grew up in the States, in Arrowhead. Um, you know, those houses will, you have to differentiate those neighborhoods because the sales, even though the houses might be similar, the sales aren't necessarily indicative of similar properties because what's the most important thing in appraising property? Land, real estate? Location, location, location. That's that is a very true and important thing to always remember. I, I must be missing something. If I live in a street neighborhood and my house is appraised at half a million dollars and you know my brother lives in a non excluded neighborhood and it's appraised at hundred thousand dollars, what is there another factor that's used to appraise the value or is it just the appraised value of the house? It's the appraised value for the house based on what similar properties in that area are selling for. So what is the fact that it's in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood come into play. 
because I'm not going to compare the property in Arrowhead oh. to one that's in Alien okay. Heights. The, those are two different neighborhoods. The sales don't correlate to each other. Because okay. there is another factor there that we don't know what it is. Yes? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, during the recent reassessment, appraisal, really. uh, in Birch 3, which is a little defined area development, the property went up 75%. A property or all of them? The underlying property. You mean the land? The land. Okay, yes. 75%. Uh, across the street, in Birch, well, that was Birch 2 that that did, and a number of other contiguous properties. In Birch 1, which is a newer development, it only went up 20%. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to tell you I never like talking about the percentage of increase or the percentage of decrease. I could have had something under appraised for years, and I could have increased the value 200% if the value is accurate and reflects sales to the area, and then that's what it is. And the problem, one of the issues we run into in Yellow Springs specifically, there is a property that is right behind the tennis courts, there by the college, um, that sold. It is probably at most a 900 square foot house that sold for almost $200,000. And it was completely redone on the inside, but I still look at it and say, I would have to set my bed up this way because there's no way there would be enough room to go this way. Um, you know, so how do I say this 900 square foot house is worth 150 and the lot's worth 50? It, that house, it, you know, I'm not ever going to say somebody overpaid. You paid, you thought you were getting, you got what you wanted for the price you wanted to get it, and somebody sold it the same way. Nobody ever overpays. There are things that motivate people. Maybe this person was a huge tennis player and loved having the tennis courts back there. Um, you know, so yeah, there are things that motivate people that may have, you know, to, to you and I may have said, well, they overpaid for that house. Um, in their mind, they didn't. And they set the value for that house when they bought it. Now, I don't chase individual sales. But overall, I look at the overall market and say, hey, look, these properties are selling for a lot more than what we have them appraised for. And you know, we, we can differentiate based on the age of the house. Uh, one of the things we used to think was kind of humorous is that new houses in Yellow Springs, and this is changing, but a new house in Yellow Springs was probably going to bring less than what we thought, where an old style house was going to bring a lot more than what we could ever get to. Location. Location. Yes? Well, I have a question about the assessment. So you guys um, contract out for that. Correct. And so what's the criteria with um, the company you use and how are they trained and then if you disagree with your um, assessment by this group can you get another assessment or can you explain that process okay, yeah, absolutely so we hired Tyler Technologies we put out a request for a proposal uh, we received proposals from five different companies um, we've worked with Tyler Technologies they have been our contract appraisers um, since I've been around, and like I said, I've been around the office for right around 20 years, maybe a little over now, I can't keep track. Um, so they're a known quantity. Um, we awarded them the contract. Um, so when they appraise a property, one thing we do is anytime your property value changes for anything other than what you did, so if you tore down a, a pole building, <coughs> and turned in an injured and destroyed property form, I'm not gonna tell you your value decreased, you know it decreased, cause, but if your value changes, I send you a letter and say, here's your new value. If you have any questions, please contact our office by this date. And that's an informal review process. 
So either way you go, you have to be willing or able to provide some evidence as to why your property isn't worth what I have it appraised for. Maybe it's a sale of a very similar property. Maybe it's the condition of your property. Um, you know, my grandfather, God bless him, 98 years old. This In two weeks, he'll be 99. But if you go into his house, it looks exactly the way it did when he bought it in 1963. He's changed the carpet and stuff like that, but the bathroom is still powder pink. Okay. Except for the, the commode, he had to replace the commode and you can't buy powder pink anymore. So he's got a white commode, but everything else is powder pink. Um, you know, this is something that I don't know. I don't get inside your house. This is information that you can give us that helps us more accurately appraise your property. Um, if you're still unhappy after the informal review, there is a formal complaint process you can go through. Um, you have to file a form. It's a one-page form, and we have three pages of instructions. Just like everything else in government, yes, it's overkill, but I want to make sure everybody gets the form filled out properly. Um, and that, that form can be filed every year between January 1st and March 31st. And I encourage people, you know, <coughs> Your value isn't personal to me. It's personal to you. I understand that. That's why when people come in yelling and screaming at me, I'm like, look, you, you think I have a personal vendetta or, or I'm trying to raise taxes by getting one over on you. If that's not what we do. We use a computer model that predicts the most likely sales price using a number of algorithms that are way too complicated for even me to understand, and I love spreadsheets that you know it produces a value and I'm gonna say the computer model I believe to be accurate 99% of the time 1% of 76,000 properties is still a lot of properties so yes 76,000 you're meaning in all of Green County yes because here it's more like 1600 or yeah but but I appraise every property in the county every three years I write update values every three years. So yeah, 76,000 parcels in Greene County, even at 99% accuracy, gives you a significant error number. And, and we don't, you know, we, I get no benefit. That, that's the thing I, I always, there is no benefit to me overtaxing you. I get nothing for it. I don't want to do it because people who are overtaxed yell. <laughs> I have a wife, I have kids, I don't need yelled at anymore. So, and, and quite honestly, the computer model that produces a value, we actually, because we know it's a computer model, we assign a value at 95% of what the computer model says. Because, again, you know, in, in statistics, you get that perfect bell curve, plus or minus two standard deviations is 5%. So, I shoot for 95%, hoping we have a good model, and that that two standard deviations covers that 5%. Again, why do I do that? Because if I shoot for 100%, I have just as many people overappraised as underappraised, and as I said, people who are overappraised yell at me. You have so, a question. So, yeah, so you mentioned three neighborhoods, hypothetically, you know, walkable, not walkable, <laughs> likable, but how many neighborhoods, how off many the, are in your algorithm? Off the top of my head, I could not tell you, but that is information that is available on our website. If you bring up our mapping application, you can bring up that map of Yellow Springs and, and go to the uh, layers. Looks like a bunch of papers sitting on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And click on the neighborhood button, and it will color code all of those neighborhoods for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. So, uh, where did we? Type, types of levies. So, let's talk about types of levies. Inside Millage was created in 1933, was 15 mills, it was reduced down to 10 mills uh, because of the Great Depression. Everybody was losing their house because of their taxes, so they reduced the tax rate. And all subdivisions that existed in 1933 get a share of that 10 mills. It's a maximum of 10 mills in any given taxing district. Um, does everybody kind of understand what a taxing district is? Okay, so a taxing district is a unique set of governments that tax a given area. So let's look at Beaver Creek Township, okay? Beaver Creek Township is, has probably 
four different taxing districts. So they have BO3, which is Beaver Creek Township, Beaver Creek City Schools. Of course, everything has Green County. Everything has the Career Center and the Health District. Then you've got BO4, which is Beaver Creek Township, Xenia Schools. You have B42, which is Beaver Creek Township, Beaver Creek City, Beaver Creek City Schools. B41, which is Beaver Creek Township, Fairborn City, Beaver Creek City Schools. So it's that unique group of entities. And I'm, I was trying to think real quick. Uh, so F19, obviously, is Yellow Springs Village, Yellow Springs Schools, Miami Township. Clifton, F18, uh, Cedar Cliff Schools, uh, Clifton Village, Miami Township, and then F16 and F17. F16, I know, is Yellow Springs Township, Yellow Springs Schools. For the life of me, I'm drawing a blank on F17. That's still. F17 is Cedar Cliff Local School District, Miami Township. Township. Okay. So. So even within Miami Township, you don't consider it to be that big of an area, but you're dealing with four different taxing districts right there. That unique set of governments. So like I said, that inside millage, that 10 mills is the maximum that can exist within a given taxing district. So you have a, a fixed sum levy. This is a levy that's intended to generate a specific amount of money. This is your Yellow Springs bond levy. It's intended to generate enough money to make the principal and interest payments over the life of the debt. It's a specific amount of money. The Budget Commission sets that rate every year so that it generates the amount of money it needs to do, needs to, in order to make those debt payments. Okay. You, you're voting on an average rate, not the actual rate. So, to, well, well, we'll get more into that when we talk about this in the letter. Can I yes. follow up on that? Uh, My understanding, this happened before I was elected to be a township trustee, but uh, <clears throat> you estimated what, what would, the rate that would be needed to fund the building of this Correct. Uh, firehouse. Uh, and in that, you made an assumption about interest rate on the bond. Uh, we ended up getting a lower interest rate. At some point, will you recalculate, and will, will there, in effect, be a slight reduction in? There has been already. Okay. So if you were to look at the rate that was voted on, mm -hmm. I would be willing to bet a large sum of money that the rate that is being taxed is much lower. So like I said, every year, we ask every subdivision, what are your debt payments going to be? And give me your debt schedule. What's your cash balance in your debt service fund? Because it can't be commingled with other money. It can only be used to retire debt. Okay. So we're always going to build a little fluff in the early years of that bond retirement in case something like a tornado comes through. And all of a sudden, it devastates your value. And we have to skyrocket that bond rate so that we can generate the money. So we want a little bit of flood there, usually about 20% of your following year's payment I want sitting in cash. So it just gives you a little flexibility. Towards the end, we knock that down to where it's at zero. But so when you vote on that, we actually consult with bond council. And bond council says, OK, here's what we think the interest rate will be. Maybe they think it's going to be 3.25%. They're going to tell us 4.25%. They're always going to estimate it higher. They give me the rate. Use this for the calculation. Okay? But remember, every year you give me that debt schedule, I know what the value is. Calculating the bond rate isn't rocket science. This really isn't. You take how much revenue do I need to generate divided by my total assessed value multiplied by 1,000. That's the rate that I'm going to charge the taxpayers so that that debt can be retired. So when the trustees want to build this building, they do some research, come up with some information about what they want to do, and there's some working between you guys and them to come up with a number for a tax, which is not accurate because you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you make it close, and then every year you reevaluate it to get right. more precise about what the upcoming years need is for paying off the bond. So it's not that it goes from 3% to 100% to 
negative six percent is floating around with Correct. three to three and a half percent. Correct. Is very that's that's hurdle. what we look for is the stability in that rate. And so again, the assumptions we make is we assume that the bond is going to have equal principal payments over the life of the debt. Very rarely do government bond issues have equal payments over the life of the debt. Why? Because bond council knows values are going to tend to increase over time. And when they increase, then they can pay off more principal at that time. So, so it's like a home mortgage, a mortgage on a house. Yeah, so it, it, it isn't because a home mortgage always has that equal principal payments. Um, the other thing is we assume that the value that the auditor has is going to remain unchanged over that 30-year life. We know that's not going to happen. So the calculation of the rate is an average based on that snapshot in time. And I'm going to tell you, when the trustees went and built this building, they estimated high, too. Because they pass a levy that says not to exceed. So, you know, they may have estimated, you know, the, the engineers come in and say, hey, look, it's going to be $20 million, but let's say you're trying to build it during COVID. Do you think that $20 million was going to be enough to build that building? Let, let's say $5 million. Okay, $5 million. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking of schools. Um, <laughs> so, so, so uh, you know, there, there is intentionally, because, you know, unlike private business, you budget things and you say, hey, look, here's how much I think this building's going to cost. And then if it costs more, you get to make that decision. Think about it. If you pass a levy and say, okay, it's going, I have a maximum of $5 million, and the, levy, and the building comes in at $7 million, yeah, you can pay cash if you've got $2 million available and still be in compliance, but you can't issue more debt than $5 million because that's all the voters approve. So we uh, covered fixed sum levies really well. Fixed rate levies. This is the most popular type of levy. These are your fire levies. Your road, well, road sometimes is inside also. Um, some of your general fund levies. Um, your, most of your school levies. Again, they have inside millage also. But you know, all of these are, are unique because how value changes determines. Uh, let me. I'm sorry. Let me. I'm going to jump back to fixed sum real quick. So because I'm trying to generate a fixed dollar amount, what happens when values go up? The rate goes down, and it still generates that amount of money. Okay. So, and with inside millage, if your value goes up, there is no reduction to that tax rate. Your taxes go up. If your value went up 10%, your taxes on that inside millage are going to go up 10%. Period, plain, simple, no questions asked. There is no reduction to that. Fixed rate levies, now it matters. Why did your value change? Did you have new construction? If you, there's new construction, the subdivisions get new money. If I reappraise your property, instead what happens is that tax rate gets reduced so that it generates the same amount of money it did in the prior year. So I'm going to ask you to stick with me here for just a moment. Let's pretend there's only one property in Miami Township. Miami Township passes a levy, a two mill fire levy. The only property in Miami Township is appraised at $100,000. That two mill levy will cost that property under $70 a year. Okay. I come along and I reappraise the property and I say, it's now worth $150,000. So I reappraised it. Nothing in that property changed. That property has remained exactly the same. It's just I said it's worth more. What these fixed rate levies do is they say, wait a minute, that doesn't mean you need more money to run government. Not on this type of levy. On inside millage, yes, but not on this type of levy. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce that tax rate to an effective tax rate of 1.33 mills, and that levy is still going to cost that person $70 a year, and the township is still just going to get $70 versus new construction, where now the township gets additional money. So if instead of me reappraising it, you built a mother-in-law suite or separate house or whatever and added $50,000 of value to your property, that is going to cost you more and result in the township getting more money. 
Now, if you think about it, it makes sense, okay? So, if I'm building a new subdivision, government needs more money because there's going to be a greater demand for services. So, they should get more money for when new construction occurs versus me reappraising something that has been there all these years doesn't mean government needs all this extra money. Now there's exceptions to this rule. Um, I really, I, if you want to talk about the 20 mil floor, we can. We'll kind of get into it a little bit, um, but we're just going to kind of scratch the surface. So why did I go through how the different types of levies work? Because it's important for you to know when I did the reappraisal, why you saw your taxes increase. So in this case, you look, I've got Yellow Springs Village and Miami Township Yellow Springs Schools. So taxing districts F19 and F16, as I like to refer to them as. So you can see inside Millage, Yellow Springs uh, Village is 10 mils. Miami Township is only 8.9. That's because everybody who lives within that boundary, whether if you're in Cedar Cliff Schools, you can't have a higher rate than one township than you do in another township. It has to be uniform. You can't have ununiform rates. So they can't get to their full 10 mils. So 15, in both cases, 15% of the levies are directly correlated with value changes. Okay. That means 85% of your levies are adjusted somehow so that an increase in your reappraised value doesn't impact your taxes. So your fixed sum levies, they represent 25 or 28% of your total millage. And remember, with fixed rate or fixed sum levies, as values go up, it doesn't really matter that rate drops down. If you have new construction, it doesn't matter why your value goes up. If you get new construction, that levy technically should cost everybody a little bit less. Now, we have fixed rate levies not subject to the floor. Okay, these are, and this is where we're going to touch on the 20 mil floor. So school districts have a floor, a 20 mil floor for schools and then a 2 mil floor for career centers or JDSs. If they have voted rates in excess of 20 mils, their rate can never go below 20 mils. There's only one school district in the state of Ohio, 612 school districts, there's only one that doesn't have voted levies in excess of 20 mils. You might want to guess where it is. Uh, Yellow Spring. It's, it's on one of the islands up off of Lake Erie. <laughs> so, um, so, what does that mean now? So, when we went through the recession, everybody except for Belbrook Sugar Creek School District was at the 20 mil floor prior to the recession. When the recession occurred and we lowered values, what we saw was the tax rates rolling up. Just like I said, the tax rates roll down if I reappraise increase, but if I reappraise decrease, those rates roll up, so they still generate the same amount of money they did in the prior year. That's so why we have property taxes. As unfair as they are, they're a very stable source of income, not subject to the mass fluctuations like income and sales tax. So now, we have, if we look at the rates that are subject to the floor and add our inside millage to it, you can see that almost 50% of your millage is directly tied to a change in your value making all of this discussion I had about fixed rate levies, while it's still true, you have to realize township doesn't have a floor. If I reappraise values and your taxes go up, realize the township isn't benefiting from that except for on that inside millage. And yes, they do have inside millage for both the general and road funds. Okay, that was pretty deep in the woods. Are there questions or is that just one of those that... All right, move on. <laughs> And I'm probably way over my time limit, aren't I? You're doing great. You're doing great. This is okay. Good. So real quick, the proposed school levy is a fixed sum levy. We already talked about everything else on here. The assumptions, the so we this is a slide we, we've already taken care of. Just know that this school levy is a fixed sum levy. So the six and a half mils is mentioned in terms of the school levy is applied to the appraised thirty-five percent of the value we're building. So the 35,000 of that 100,000, Yeah, that. so if you wanted to calculate what this levy is projected to cost you, you have $100,000 of appraised value times the assessment ratio, proposed millage, 
And if you, because it won't qualify for any of the credits except for homestead, so per $100,000, uh, the estimated annual cost without homestead is $227.50. The estimated annual cost with homestead is $170,62. But remember that homestead is set. So if you have a $200,000 home, you have to remember, the first 100,000 is gonna cost you $170.62. The next $100,000 is gonna cost you $227.50. So if I plug my appraised value from your website in, in place of 100,000 to do those calculations, the bottom line is what my increase would be. Right, so here's what I would encourage you to do instead. Go to our website, we have a tax levy estimator. You put in your name, you bring up your property, it will tell you what every levy that has already passed, I'll get that in just a second. Um, every levy that has already passed and those that are on the ballot that have not passed yet, and it will tell you on your property how much that levy will cost you. So I was told you guys would, would want, now Dave, you don't understand this group, they're gonna wanna sit down with their pen and pencil or their spreadsheet and recalculate. So I've given you the tools to do that. But if you want to take the easy way out, my staff, I have a great staff, a lot smarter than what I am, um, that built a, a uh, program that would actually allow you to bring up your property. Yes, and they've been very helpful when Jeremy's, my husband, is coming to talk about that. They've been very helpful. Oh, yes, sir, I'm sorry, I, I forgot already. Clarify though, when we're looking at the value details, I see the appraised and the 35% assessed. Um, but when we're using that formula, we do want to use the total of the improvement value and the land value, or are we just looking at the property itself? You're looking at your total value. Just Always look at the value. total. Um, Ohio Revised Code requires that I appraise land and building separate, which is how Jerry knows that I increased land values in Yellow Springs 75%. Um, there's really no rationale. If you live in my neighborhood, there has not been a land sale in my neighborhood. Uh, see, we've lived there for 26 years. It was there a good five years before. So 30 years since land has sold. We don't know what a lot's worth in my neighborhood. What we know is what land and building are worth. And then we have to allocate that value to each other. But in the Yellow Springs case, like I said, at some point you say, I can't put any more in this building. It's 900 square feet. It's got to go on the land. So where do your taxes go? Yellow Springs schools get 54% of your taxes. The Career Center gets about 5%. That is very standard. The average percentage of school districts take on property taxes usually ranges from 55 to 65%. In a high tax rate school district, you might get a little higher than that. Um, the village gets 13% of the money. The township gets 8% of the money. Okay, so remember, the township, you're paying for two levies for the township. Well, three if you count the fire building, fire operating, and then the general fund. Okay, so because they're providing fire services, you also have to pay their general fund. What you don't pay is you don't pay any of the township's road levies. The township does nothing for roads inside the village, or not statutorily required to. I shouldn't say you don't, but you're not statutorily. So, a lot of great tools. Go to Green Online. We have a lot of cool stuff out there dealing with property taxes, including something that allows you to look at what your property value is and how it compares to other properties. It, it will bring up a map that will show you sales in your area. It will include your neighborhood code and it will bring up sales of your neighborhood. So again, these are the categorizations that we make. Property tax levy estimator, again, great tool. If you're looking at building a new house, uh, we also have a tax levy estimator, um, or a tax estimator that allows you to say, hey look, if I build a $500,000 house, what's that gonna cost me in taxes? So a lot of cool toys on Green Online. But you may wanna tell them they have to drill down to the order. No, 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 this is right there on the front page going, I, and like I said, I wish I could bring up the internet here. Right across the top, 
you'll see it says government, departments, green online. Green online is where you want to go. That's where all of these toys are. You can get to them from my page also, but if my page, I, I tend to think of it more, if you're looking for a form, you're gonna to need to come to my page. If you wanna fill out the Homestead application, that form's gonna be on my page. But, again, you know, all the, the cool toys, bells, and whistles, they're right there in the middle, on the top, green online. Um, so we, we have a, a list of every property tax levy. Um, we uh, probably, the paper that I, I, I take great pride in it, it's a five page paper that explains property taxes in Ohio. I try to share it with every legislator I meet. I'm pretty sure none of them have read it yet. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, I guarantee you it's not necessarily an easy read, but one of the things I always say is that if you read it before you come and listen to me talk about property taxes, you're going to have a lot more questions. And then you're probably going to need to read it again after you hear me talk about property taxes. Um, it's an in-depth, it, it goes step-by-step step on all the you different levies. So. Yeah. I'm sorry? you got to let it settle. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, with that, I am done, but I am still willing to answer any questions anybody has. We communicated earlier this year when the big data news pointed out that the CAU values, uh, values for a farm property, their valuation went down. Correct. While residential property went up. Correct. Could you clarify that? So, so you have to remember there are two, well, we're, we're going to just talk about real property. There are two classes of property. You have commercial and industrial is in one class. We're not going to talk about those. Ag reds are in class together. So what happens when one value goes down? So if the if I know this levy, that two mil levy has to generate seventy dollars a year. We've already predetermined that, right? So if the ag values go down, even if the residential properties don't deep increase, there is a shift of that tax burden. That seventy dollars represents a pie, and everybody who has value has a share of that pie as a percentage of their total value. So if, and, and the same thing were to happen, if Jerry and I own the only two properties in Miami Township, I come along, we, they're each appraised at $100,000, we would share that $140 liability now equally. We'd each pay 70, but I come along and reappraise and I raise his, you know, 30% and I raise my 10%, his taxes just went up because he owns a larger share of that pie now. Now, here's what I'm going to say, though, and, and I'm going to tell you, my association is not necessarily, you know, they're, they're focused on that this is a shifting of the tax burden from the agricultural properties to the residential properties. The same thing happened during the recession. Farm values were going up 200% per year, okay? or not per year, I'm sorry, every three years. Every time we did an update, they were seeing a 200% increase while residential property values were decreasing because of the recession. That also created a shift in that burden. So I always say, don't, you know, if you're gonna look at it, look at it historically and say, if it shifted back then, why shouldn't it shift now? Now they made changes to the formula that kind of caused this decrease in CAUV values. I'm not a farm expert. I told you I grew up in the city of Xenia. Went to Xenia High School. I've never lived on a farm, and quite honestly, I like city water and sewer, so. <laughs> yes? I'm going to speak completely hypothetical here. But well, let's assume mm -hmm. that there might be a levy coming up that was going to last for 37 years. And we're told that after an eight to 10 year period, there's going to be a 26% reduction because of a state amount of money that can come in to offset the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does that get calculated? Is, is it really going to be a 26% reduction after the 10 years? Because how do they account for the first 10 years of that levy? So again, I'm going to set the rate every year based on the principal and interest payments. So 
when um, President Obama was in office, he created the shovel ready sites. I can't remember the name of the program. Okay, but we had schools that were being built under that program. Okay, so we had Cedar Cliff schools and Xenia schools were both built as shovel ready sites where the federal government guaranteed, I am going to give you X amount of money per year to offset your cost of issuing these, this debt. So when I set that bond rate, I not only look at what the principal and interest payments are, but I say, what are your other sources of income that are dedicated to this specifically? Now, the federal government, and once again, remember if anybody ever says, hi, I'm from government, I'm going to help you <laughs> run, because the federal government put sequestration in. Oh, yeah. And then they decreased these payments that were guaranteed to these school districts for having built these schools. So the bond rate actually went up higher because this was something that was planned. I'm going to tell you, when I built that tax rate, and I'm the one who certifies tax rates for the ballot, okay. I did not consider any outside sources of income. So if they develop an outside source of income, then yes, they would be required to let me know about that so I can set their rate accurately. So does the amount of money that is paid by the homeowner change drastically when that comes into play, when that nine, ten yeah, million dollars shows up, or, does, the, or do, does it just pay off more faster? So here, it, it would, ideally it would decrease, I don't know, what, what are they gonna, are they gonna, I, this is the first I've heard about it. Okay. So obviously I've done no research. If they're gonna give you a lump sum, um, then either way you go, if you're retiring debt earlier, um, then it's going to reduce that principal and interest payment, which would in turn reduce your re bond rate, which would reduce your taxes. Okay. But that so, reduction would only start when they actually got the money. Correct. Well, that's yes. why I wonder, would, would that reduction then ultimately change from 26% to maybe like 31% to catch up for the first 10 years that there's no reduction? So, it, I, here's what I'm going to tell you is what bond council would do if this is a guaranteed money that they're going to get in year 11 or whatever year they're going to start getting it is bond council will set up the debt schedule so that it the principal payment goes up significantly in year 11 because bond council has really the same goal as what I do that's not to have people yell at them or, or the school district who hires bond council you know they're looking up in that nice level bond rate. Once you get used to paying it, you, you don't necessarily, you know, you, you don't see it go down. It does go down over time. It, I guarantee you it does go down over time. But you don't really see it. It's when it spikes up that you, you see it. So I, I always thought it was funny. Um, Cedarville Township, it's probably been 10 years ago, decided we've got plenty of road levy money. We don't have any major projects. We are foregoing our inside millage on our road levy for a year. Taxes went down on every property owner by that 1.45 mills that they had in their road levy, road inside millage. The next year when they put it back on, nobody called to say, hey, my taxes went down, what happened? Instead, when that levy was reinstituted, that's when everybody called to yell and I'm like, you had a government acting responsibly, only taxing what they felt they needed, and then when they needed it again, it's hard for you to have a solid position to yell at them for actually saying, yes, we have a major road project now, we need to get done. But. So with this bond, uh, came down the bond after maybe seven to 10 years on the OFCC, Is there any way that we can get a guesstimate or any kind of a close approximation of what the total cost would be at the end of that 37 years? I mean, I can give it to you, but it's based on flawed assumptions. It's based on equal value throughout the life. I mean, yes, you can you can do a calculation. Um, as soon as, here's the problem is nobody's come up you can ask the school district if they have a debt schedule that has been proposed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that will tell you what your total principal and interest costs are over. But 
you aren't going to bond something until you actually pay for it. You know, I, I'm not going to go out and issue a $30 million bond to build a new school and find out it only costs $25 million. Um, it's just not what you do. You, you say, okay, here's my cost. I know them now. I'm going to issue bond anticipation notes. I'm going to issue debt. But it's not going to be a 30-year bond that I'm, or 37 years, 37-year uh, bond, because I don't know what my actual costs are going to be. The county used to actually get in trouble periodically. They would get an engineer's estimate. Well, not in trouble, but, and they would issue debt based on that engineer's estimate. Not a one-year note, but the actual bond. And we got, the, the cost came in under, and now we've got this excess money that we're investing. Federal government doesn't like for governments to take cash from a debt issue and make money on it because we're investing it back then. You couldn't do it now, of course, with interest rates what they are, but we were investing it at a higher rate than what we were paying in interest. And that created an arbitrage liability, and we have to pay that as a kind of a tax to the IRS because we have that issue. Let's assume a whole bunch of things that you can't assume are true, like we know all this information you're saying is no way to know. You borrow $30 million and then start paying it off. Everything goes into place and taxpayers are paying off the $30 million. And then after 10 years, the state says, here's, here's $10 million back. The question that I have is, and maybe other people want to this is what you're getting at, I'm not quite sure. Well, all of a sudden our taxes drop way down. Or does, or, or does the tax rates, the, the, the tax bill stay pretty much the same, except that now that the, the school district has got another 10 million bucks, that they paid off a chunk of the loan, does the principal amount go way up, like paying ahead on a mortgage several years? I mean, that is certainly something they, they could do. They could early retire debt. Um, you know, again, there's, there's just so many options. It's hard to say this is what they do. But if what I'm going to say is that if there's a $10 million inflow of cash that was not planned for this project, it was and planned. I, well, not for me setting the bond rate, because yeah, I know it wasn't given to me. In my fantasy example. Okay, it, okay. In, in your fantasy example, then they're going to set up that debt schedule to account for that large payment. So it, they would build, so everybody remember during the mortgage crisis, the balloon payments? Yeah. If they knew they were going to get a $10 million lump sum payment in year 11, they would have a balloon payment built during that year of that debt schedule. Yeah, this is the, the curiosity of this is we don't know if it's going to be debt year 7 or year 10 or something like that. So that's, we don't know how that uncertainty adds to their ability to create a bond schedule and how they pass the cost. Yeah, so, and, th and this is really is a conversation I've known Tammy Henrik for a number of years. She's yeah. an outstanding reach out to her and say, look, I'm, I'm really confused because, you know, like I said, I hadn't heard anything yeah, about this until okay. tonight. And so playing this supposed game, it's like I, I could be getting myself in more trouble yeah. um, trying to explain it. Do you, do you understand the, um, the OFC also, you know, they, they offer this money in the future, which, you know, we just ask questions about. But there was also an additional millage that they, um, that's mandatory, a 0.5? Yeah, so anytime you build a, under the school facilities program, you have to have a permanent improvement aspect to your issue. So uh, Cedar Cliff did their permanent improvement as an income tax. I believe is that what Yellow Springs Schools is doing okay. also? No, well, it's, it's no, it's because it's 6.5, so they included the 0.5 in the, in the property tax. They also have income tax, and we're curious about that, because I think this is the first time that we've done it. Yeah, I don't do income taxes. Yeah. I only focus on property taxes. I okay. get in trouble um, when I talk about income taxes. Fair more people um, yelling. No, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I was a joke. I said I, I do five income tax returns a year. Oh, six, sorry. I have four children, my uh, mother and my wife and I. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only income taxes, and that's only because I'm too cheap to pay some money. Right, exactly. Oh, I, okay, okay, okay. We like our spreadsheets, right? Yes, we like our spreadsheets, but so, I shouldn't have to pay $50 to go buy TurboTax to figure out income times rate equals this. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it with, this, with Excel, that's what I do. 
<laughs> so, but do you understand? Do you understand? So, because they put something very curious in the paper. They said it was could only be used in very specific. The, the funding from it could only be used in very specific situations. It was catastrophic need. So for the permanent improvement portion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the, the goal of the school facilities program was, look, we're giving you a lot of money to build these new schools. Take care of them. And I don't want it to be a situation where 20 years later you're coming back to me and saying, I have no money to maintain my building. They literally, so it it's kind of puts me in an awkward situation. So as a member of budget commission, part of my job is to make sure subdivisions aren't accumulating wealth, that they're actually spending their tax dollars and not just sitting on them. And then they come up with this type of levy that says, no, you can't spend it. And as a member of the budget commission, they're sitting here going, well, why aren't I cutting it? All they're doing is accumulating wealth. But that's what the statute requires that they do because ideally you're not gonna have anything major that needs to be done to that building in probably 15, 20 years, but that money is going to be there to take care of that new roof, that paving, the new boiler, whatever, well, they don't use boilers now, but uh, yeah, new HVAC system, how's that? <laughs> okay. Roof. Roof. It's just, I didn't see catastrophic in, you know, when PI, when PI levies are discussed in like the state budget, um, handbook and things like that. I didn't find catastrophic needs listed among the uses. So it was curious why that was. I, I don't know that a catastrophic need, I mean, I think a catastrophic need, a tornado that hits that building would certainly probably be an eligible use of those funds. But ideally it's that you have reserves set aside so that, like I said, in 20 years you're not coming back to the state saying, I need new school buildings. No. We, we made sure that you were set up to have money to maintain those buildings. Come back to me in 50 years, and maybe we'll talk. Jerry, you had another question? No, uh, I just, never mind. It's not on the weeds. I live there. Well, we can have weeds. Well, we can have weeds questions on the side. <laughs> we currently have 14 levies in the school for the school comprising that percentage. And some of them, they kind of lumped them in the 1976, and we're still paying on them. But the they passed at about, here's one at 2.6 mils, it's now down to 0.82 dot dot dot. Okay. But we also have some fixed rate mill uh, levies. Two emergency levies and a bond levy. Yeah. that are still at the, the levy to pay. So they roll off, are adjusted. They're adjusted, they don't roll off, they're adjusted, but they can't go below 20 mils. Total. Total for general fund levies. So your permanent improvement levy, which is also a fixed rate levy, can roll down, it will, it will never get to zero, but it will, work its way to zero as if property values continue to increase and increase and increase. So what you're looking at is this, did you print this off of the county website or do you make it up? I print it off the, uh, is form. Okay. So it's available. I, yeah. I can dig it up. You, you dig out your own form, your own, in. first of all, everybody should be able to look up on his website what your property tax is and where every dollar goes. And surprise the number of people that don't. Because it'll show all 14 levies. What was it? What did they pass for the the full millage and then the taxable millage and his adjustments take you from the full millage to the taxable millage. I, and if you guys, I, again, the presentation was kind of driven, um, you know, based on comments that have heard. But if you guys want a, a, a session, it'll be much shorter. Um, of the tools that we have out there, I mean, again, the, the amount of information, you know, not just for your property, but for the subdivision. How much tax revenue did, property tax revenue only, did the village of Yellow Springs get last year? 
How much did they get the year before that? This is all information that's out there. It's available to you. That you have to dig a little further for. That's not sitting out there, you know, because it, it's usually for people who really want to do some research and go like, I want to know what's going on. Which is why I always hate when, when subdivisions say, this is um, a renewal levy that's been in place since 1976. It doesn't generate any more money now than what it did in 1976. I'm like, yes, look at your financial statements. You don't even have to go to my website to see the, the increases. Look at your own statements. But we continue to have people in government who don't fully understand property taxes and not intentionally, but unintentionally misinform the public. And then you get, they lose credibility. And every time a government official loses credibility, every one of us in government loses credibility. Well, because yeah. we, we've had um, people who, you know, they talk about the PI levy specifically is that we have one that's for annual maintenance right now. And so there's, uh, I think it's like around $170,000 that goes into that a year. And this PI levy that's what, that there is, is in the proposed levy, right? That's one that's for more for capital expenses. It sounds like that's stuff that you, that you, that you accumulate over years. So what, what a lot of schools have done, these schools did it early on as they passed the permanent improvement levy to buy school buses, school books. Things that you don't necessarily think of in terms of, I'm not saying they couldn't repair the building with that money or even build a new oh, building. Yeah. It's Our, a legal use for it. Yeah. But it wasn't the reason the levy was passed. It was to take some of their, what they looked at as, you know, five year expenditures and pay for them outside of the general fund. Now, why did they want to do that? Well, because they wanted that outside of the 20 mil floor and the permanent improvement levy doesn't count against that floor. So remember, school districts want to be at that 20 mil floor because that's the only way they get increases. When I was talking at Bellbrook Sugar Creek School District about their levy, they are not at the 20 mil floor. So guess what? I, if you were to look at new construction when it occurs, and, and everybody would look out there at, at Bellbrook Sugar Creek area and go, look at all these half a million dollar houses going up, Cornerstone, all this development. How are, how are they not swimming in money from all of this new construction? If you add up all of that new construction, it amounts to about two or three percent of their total value in any given year. Remember, most levies get reduced so that they generate the same amount of money they did because of reappraisal changes. So the only new money they're getting is from new construction. New construction comes with additional costs. If you're building a new subdivision, I have to hire more teachers. So while they're getting more revenue, they're also having an increase on the expense side. And that's the thing you have to remember when you're, you're talking about property taxes are so unfair. They are, but they, they give you stability that other taxes don't, and unfortunately, because they give you stability, they don't have massive growth in them, except for on that inside millage, which represents a relatively small portion of the total millage. Unless your school district has 20 mil floor, and then the tax of the inside millage. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we should. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you, sir. Yes. Certainly. Very helpful. I'd like to commend your, you and your crew <laughs> for your website. Nice. I've used it for years, and it's one of the best in the state. And I didn't even know about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this we uh, our, our website, especially our property stuff, had gotten pretty dated. Um, you know, it, it's funny because we just won an award for our website, an international award. Yes. Now, we won that same award about 15 years ago, but until we got this new GIS guy, we were still presenting stuff like we did 15 years ago in the rest of the world and kind of passed us by. We're back up with him.